program that I have for you is called Big Fires in a Little Town, and it kind of stemmed from when that show, uh, Little People in a Big World, came in. Uh, from Washington County, Maryland, uh, my name is Will Ball, and I'm Chief of Williamsport Volunteer Fire and EMS. If you ever try to look up Williamsport, Maryland, you'll see that George Washington wanted to make it, make it the capital at one point in time uh, back in the day. But very historical area, uh, Antietam Battlefield, uh, uh, if, if you're familiar for that, with that. But we, we have fires. We don't have a lot of them, but uh, a lot of room and contents, a uh, mixture of rural areas. But uh, we've had two pretty significant fires over the last couple of years that have brought out a lot of things that we know we need to do better uh, as a fire service. So when we started reviewing these incidents, we said, wait a minute, I wonder how many other small towns that uh, mutual aid might be 20 minutes away, 30 minutes away. How, how are they preparing if their town center, if they have a population of four to 500 people maybe in their town or 1,500 people in their town, if their town center's burning, how do they handle that when they have to wait for help? So... Not very well, and, and we experienced that. Uh, my good friend uh, Chief Yost here, his his closest fire company is uh, almost 12 miles away. So from the time that they get out until the time that they, they get to his town that, that he's protecting, it, it, it's a little while. And we have a couple incidents that uh, has occurred. Uh, this picture that you're seeing right there is actually uh, someone that's driving to the fire state, to to the ambulance station, and they got out of their car because they had to stop for a school bus. I'm sorry. They had to stop for a school bus. School was canceled, and the school bus driver didn't know. Um, that morning, well, it was a pretty, they were a private contractor, and they canceled it pretty uh, late into the day or into the morning because the ice came. So they got out and snapped this picture as they were going. So and that's about uh, six blocks away from uh, where the actual fire was. So... Um, Got some video for you to watch that, uh, of the person that lived right next door, and I have an audio for you to listen to. Uh, the audio, what I want you to listen to is listen to command and control issues. See if the incident commander was able to maintain control. Uh, listen to, to the voices. We had a lot of really strange stuff happen within the first 10 minutes of the incident uh, on the radio. And at that time, our radio system was a low band, 33.860. And all of our tactical channels, we did have tactical channels, we're in the same bandwidth. So um, we had been talking for years about a new radio system. However, it wasn't with us yet. So we overpowered the radio system almost immediately with this type of uh, response that we had. Let's see if I can figure out this mouse. Washington County, Maryland's 472 square miles, has 27 fire EMS companies. Not everybody's in the same house. The uh, department that I am the chief at, in 2006, we started some consolidation, and we do have EMS in our firehouse now, but uh, most of the EMS is separate. Um, we have eight municipalities. <clears throat> Two of the fires that we're going to talk about happened in the municipalities. When we started doing the after action report, we said, what's the mission with this? There was a lot of things that were coming out, and the chief of this department, uh, Chief Ole Griffith from Boons Boonesboro, Maryland, said, we've got to make a difference. Well, we're still trying to make a difference from this incident in our county. We're moving forward, baby steps. Uh, and, we'll, and we'll talk about some of that stuff. But we wanted to share the challenges that were presented because he'd never been, in, he'd been a forest firefighter, uh, he's a firefighter at Fort Detrick, and he's been involved in some pretty big incidents, but nothing that uh, overwhelmed him like this. The town of Boonesboro is very historical. Uh, was incorporated in 1831. It's grown leaps and bounds. Uh, they were a, maybe 2,000 population in their town, and they have a bunch of residential area that has come about, and so they were able to, their, their population's really grown. They have two stations. They have a substation. They have a, uh, about 
uh, an 80 square mile response district, so they have a substation in place. Uh, they run four engines, one ladder, a brush unit, some support units, and you can see their command structure. They were very fortunate to get an AFG grant for staffing, which was p paid very valuable that day uh, because the fire is, behind the, is right next door to the fire station. So guys couldn't get to the station. So they had to run the alleys to be able to get there. Uh, some of the things that we're going to talk about. The incident challenges of, of managing a large-scale incident. A lot of us may be very, very good at being incident commanders on a 1,200 square foot residential dwelling, some auto accidents, barn fires, uh, light commercial. We, we know how to manage that. But when you start adding two, three, four alarms, almost 100 people, we don't do that every day where I come from. We just don't. Um, accountability system, multi-jurisdictional responses. We had uh, three counties and two states respond to this fire. And the same thing with the other fire that we're going to review. All the radio frequencies were different. Some were on 800, some were on high band. Well, we don't have all those radios in our vehicles to do that. <clears throat> the picture that you see here is the actual start of the fire, the one on the left. It started as a result of a propane heater malfunctioning, and it grew rapidly. Um, I'm going to play a brief video for you about some of this. So it gives you a little better take of what the guys were encountered with. Talk up. And the building right across from me is on fire. And the telephone pole is on fire. All right, look, the telephone pole. Cool. Oh my. That telephone pole is about to come down. The fire station is to immediately to the left. <clears throat> this is a hotel, uh, an old hotel, that is being uh, remodeled by Nora Roberts. Everybody know who Nora Roberts is, the love novelist? She owns all four sides of this square. So, uh, as the building's taken off, You'll see. They don't have any help there yet. First engine came out, went down past the fire, laid a four inch line from in front of the fire station at the fire hydrant. <clears throat> see the wooden porch to the center of the picture? Propane tank number one just lit off. They had to rescue uh, two of the workers from that. They got trapped up on that scaffolding. When it got into the second building, next to this hotel, we'll call it the Boone Hotel, it's common attic all the way across to the town hall. So that created its challenges in itself that we now needed to get the town hall evacuated. Those are live, Bob. Both of those are. Get away. Both of those are live. Twenty couple degrees, ice on the roads, volunteer department, uh, had a tough time getting there. Um, closest fire department, their next due, is nine miles away. We have a five minute response time. Five minute response time uh, before they replace us um, in our county.
They were fortunate they have a ladder. The ladder truck comes out of the back of the building and could go down the alley and out to the front street to be able to get to the front of the building. I must say that there is quite a I didn't even freaking straighten my hair, so. Huh? Hey, see, it's been into it a little bit. They've got some collapse. So if your community's painted, the picture that I've painted is, is, is about this size. Is there anyone here in the, in the audience that's uh, about the size of this community? Okay. Are you ready? Prepared? Pre-plans? Well, this department was, uh, was a little bit ready. Um, they, had always, they had always said for years... As soon as, if, if this hotel burnt, now it's burnt twice before, I forgot to mention that. And it only went the second alarm, because they got a real good stop on it. Um, and that's shortly before Nora Roberts uh, bought it um, to, to begin the remodel. But this picture is taken from one of the firefighters' uh, daughters right across the street. Um, you know, single family dwellings along their main street uh, with that. Commercial properties all the way down, more sort of like a taxpayer. Apartments above, commercial, uh, light commercial, or subway, um, pizza shop, and things all down down low. Get yeah, 26 degrees that day, pretty icy. Schools were canceled late. Three-story stonemason building, heavy timber, heavy timber burned in there for days. Picture that the fire department took just before, uh, about three weeks before the fire started. Obviously, the blue tarp isn't burned off yet. A lot of our communities have this type of construction. Older communities, we don't find that today. You know, even in our uh, medium to light commercial. Pictures that we, we were able to get uh, as the first alarm units were, were, were arriving. Um, as you can see, there's not a lot of traffic, but that's steam from the heat that was being produced off the wet road, which then created a, a visibility hazard for the crews arriving. Don't see a lot of fire trucks there yet, do you? Took off. The one picture here on the right, lady took with her digital camera, or son took with her digital camera, is uh, they're waiting at the traffic light. They could feel the heat coming through their uh, the windshield. And how I even got this picture was uh, she worked at the doctor's office that I went to because I left this fire and went to the doctor's office and ended up with pneumonia. So. Uh, she says, oh, yeah, she was telling me, we were trying to get to work and ran into that fire. Because I had actually called her from the fire and said, I'm feeling like crap and I need to get, get something. The first 10 minutes, as those propane cylinders lit off, it just sent vapor cloud and the heat radiating down the block. Because it was under construction, all the void spaces were open. So it, it just had a, a horizontal travel, which the fire department uh, had some idea that, of what they were doing, but they hadn't been into the building in a while to see what renovations that were being done. Take a couple minutes here and let you listen to the audio of what the companies were confronted with when they first got it. Because that kind of set the tone for about the first 45 minutes of the event. Hey, 
The county used to do a pre-alert to kind of give us a heads up that we were getting a, call, a structure fire. Unfortunately, they don't do that anymore. You guys hear that okay? As all these tones are dropping, what we did uh, about a year before this is we established what we called a standardized dispatch. Every structure fire would get a minimum of the same number of units, the same number of engines, ladders, uh, rescue companies, uh, and ambulances. We don't have any type of battalion chiefs or anything like that that respond. The chief's the guy standing right as he was getting ready to step on the four inch hose. Rush That's not ice off the that sign. That's the heat melted sign. They missed the set of tones. Our tones are generated automatically now. <laughs> and the tones they missed was their second due company. <laughs> As they're taking hundreds of 911 calls for this, they've got a working cardiac arrest going on with EMD in our first due area. Why they never heard it is the fire station lost power. Guess what they had a hard time getting out? The fire trucks. They didn't have a backup generator at the time. Called Murphy's Law. Squad's responding driver only. Ambulance with two. The first out engine went with two. Do they have enough people to start doing anything yet? Yeah, you know, we have that fast attack. Command mode. Yeah, they didn't have a lot of help. Shepherdstown ladder truck was the second due ladder truck on the first alarm. So you can see the progress that the fire took them to get there. And they're about 15 miles away. Second alarm on Box 61 North Main Street in Bisborough. 
operator, engine company 7, for the Daniel State 9, company 12, engine company 10, engine company 16, truck 2, truck engine 83, area 25, we had you at 255, respond, the answer is follow channel 1, operations tax 3746. <laughs> Three dispatchers on at the time. Did you hear that third alarm? That wasn't the chief that called for the third alarm. It was a DC firefighter. He jumped up in the front of the ladder of their engine and requested the third alarm. wasn't even wasn't a volunteer of the department, an officer. But he was on his way home from work and he requested the third alarm. The chief finally gets notified of the third alarm assignment, and now he's reporting people trapped, which they did. Reporting people trapped, seven forty-seven. The apartment buildings to the left. That's the end of the next one. We're going to release a fourth alarm. It's taking the whole block. We've got people in buildings. Report track. Copy of one is two is six. That's the end of the next one. Please get to CAC 3, converse with command. It's on the wrong channel. The engine operator didn't have a chance to switch over to the tactical channel. He was on a portable. He's talking on the dispatch channel, giving that fourth alarm, third alarm, and fourth alarm request. Kind of takes your situational awareness away as the incident commander, doesn't it? You're, you're thinking second alarm. Okay, I'm on the scene. I have a three-story commercial structure, heavy fire shelling from Alpha Delta Charlie exposures on the Alpha Bravo and Charlie side. His siren still on because he's driving around the block to do a size up. Okay. Okay, I'll be assuming Main Street. Seriously, he did. Main Street command. That was the easiest way for him to get a size up done. Because the way he had to come in the, uh, to, from the north side of town. We have somebody on channel one requesting a third alarm. Your pleasure. Three quarters to Main Street Command. Go ahead, headquarters. Command, we have somebody screaming on channel one to start a third alarm. This dispatcher said screaming? Of course, give us a third alarm. Uh, this is in the downtown commercial area. I got tired running down uh, the block at this time. We're trying to make a stop probably about the, at the 20th Main Street. 20th Main Street, Town Hall, Town Library, in, in history building. Rescue engine 6-1 priority. Rescue engine 6-1, go ahead. Go ahead and strike a fourth alarm. The whole block, we have people trapped in adjoining buildings. This kid ran across the street. And we have a fourth alarm. It's on your standby. And we went across the street. We had fire burning on all four sides. We will comply at 748. Okay, try to set something over at the library. What's that? Uh, seven, eight minutes. So, I mean, that's tough. You figure if you're going to try to manage. All the companies that you heard dispatched on the first alarm. And they had four engines, two ladders, ambulances and rescue squads, and they were all coming to short staff. And trying to manage that, you know, and get your lines laid. We didn't have predetermined running assignments yet of what the first engine did, the second engine. Um, that's one of our, the bullet points that came out of this. We still don't have it. I think this third, last night, they were supposed to vote on the standard. This is 2008. We, we have challenges when it comes to getting operational procedures through our county because of organizational diversities. Is that politically correct, Greg?
All right. So from your arrival, obviously, you know, we look at our, our size up. We had reports of, 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 of life safety concerns. First priority, exposure protection, property conservation. Um, didn't have a lot of help to do that. Exposure control was becoming very challenging because within the first seven minutes, you had two engines there, first engine with two, second engine with one, a ladder truck with two or three, a couple people in POVs and the chief in the chief's car. Chief lives about seven miles outside of town in the mountains. So it took him, took him when he said he could see it, well, he, he could because he was coming, he comes down and the town sit, sits a little bit into a valley. Immediate concerns of firefighter safety. You know, they had the collapse. You could see that in, 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 the, in the main fire building where it started. They didn't know what direction it was going to go because of the stability of it, because of all, everything else. 7.30 in the morning. It's like Mayberry, USA. Where does everybody go in Mayberry at 7 o'clock, 7.30 in the morning? Downtown diner. Okay? The downtown diner, the outside of it, you saw the one picture there with the fireman standing in front of it with the melted vinyl siding. That was the downtown diner. So now you've got citizens that have self-deputized themselves to become firemen. Accountability nightmare? Yeah. The chief did give a pretty clear incident action plan. He says it's running the street. He gave an address for it to stop at and to preserve property. A lot of freelancing and, 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 again, accountability issues. You had a firefighter that wasn't a volunteer there that was on his way home from work, got his turnout gear out of his car, and started fighting fire. He called for the third alarm and fourth alarm. How many times did he call for the fourth alarm? Three times. Three times that he called for it. Limited first alarm staffing. In our, in our area, uh, the volunteer departments are pretty fortunate that we have a fair amount of paid guys or career firefighters, but they have to travel to Montgomery County, um, Frederick County, Hagerstown, Maryland. Um, I work full-time for Hagerstown. I was actually at work when this call came in. I was just getting off uh, at 7.30 in the morning. So people that left to go to work and people that are on their way home, the department staffing that it would normally have of maybe six or seven people that would be around in the daytime wasn't there. And now you had another element which totally got changed for a couple of them as they were calling their uh, in-laws or their parents to make sure that they got their kids because they were going to the fire because they're usually daddy daycare. Communications overload. Uh, three times uh, in, in our incident action plan that we were able to point out that one of the, uh, the rescue chiefs had radioed that they'd done successful rescues. You never hear that in the tape. Never. Even dissecting it down on the, the fancy computer equipment that they have, they, they never went out. It's a flaw of, it was a flaw of our radio system. You know, low band, big whip antennas, great thing to beat the probies with, you know, type thing, whip them in the shape. Command and control uh, in developing the, the incident management system. Chief established command. He identified it. Single biggest thing, uh, and, and he knows that what I say, is he got out of his car. He's an aggressive firefighter. He's a captain of Fort Detrick. He, he, he loves to still fight fire. Um, and he got out of his car. So what happened to him when he got out? He got sucked right in. Started pulling hose lines. Can't be a working, that can't be a fast attack command or a working command with an incident like this. Uh, he's since had bigger incidents or, or incidents not of, of this size, and he, you know, he always calls me and jokes. He says, I stayed in the car, or I didn't leave the car. I stayed real close to the hood, okay? And, you know, and that's a controversial uh, thing throughout the fire service. Do you command from the front? Do you command from the car? You know, there's, there's a lot of different opinions. Uh, mine is depending on the situation. Situation like this, you know, hide. You can see it, just hide somewhere. 
Um, the main power transmission lines runs right there on Main Street. The entire town, outside community, lost power almost within a few minutes of the fire happening. Right outside town is about a 150-bed uh, nursing home that went on emergency generator power. So start thinking of, as, as, as I'm giving you some of this stuff, think about the long-range planning that you're going to have to start to do to keep your, your community in some continuity. You know, here's your fire station that's right next door that couldn't get fire trucks out. Lost radio transmissions. Rescued four people, rescued the one worker, uh, exposure control. Apparatus placement had visibility issues because of, of the smoke and everything and then the steam that was coming off the streets. I mean, it literally started bubbling the, the vinyl or the, uh, the asphalt street. Uh, melted the back part of the engine and the engine was parked on the other side of the square. Again, just to kind of summarize the, the, the first alarm assignment that kind of came through, 23 people at 7.30 in the morning with all those companies. And the ones in yellow are, are mutual aid that went, went outside of our county. And only a few of those are career. Frederick County and Loudoun County were the only career departments that would provide the guaranteed staffing. So they had 91 people for a four-alarm fire. Four-alarm fire in a large municipality, how many do you think that might bring? 100? 150? Who's, who, who back, I saw somebody back here that had a, uh, their hand up for a similar community. How long would it take you to get 91 people to your fire? Some of the life safety concerns. You had the Boone Hotel. You had seven workers there. That's the main fire building. Across the street at the sweet shop, you had three people inside. The subway, the upstairs, was empty. Um, part of the renovation kind of helped it move. Subway was right next door to the Boone Hotel. Just opened up. Took them almost two and a half years to get uh, rebuilt. Apartment building had a next on, on down the way had two people in it, and at 15 North Main had three people. Um, for the longest time, we thought we lost one because his car was there. People were panicking. Um, couldn't find him in the apartment. His apartment was well involved at that point. Um, thought we lost one. And he wasn't answering his cell phone. Well, he wasn't answering it because it was just still in the, he forgot it when he went to work. His car wouldn't start. Got a ride, called, a, called a buddy of his, picked him up, forgot his cell phone on the counter. And there, there, was, there was some panic looking for him. Because I mean, they, they know these people. Their fire station's right there, so they know the people that, that's living close to them. Across the street, they had a pizza shop. had four people inside. The beauty salon. Crawford's Confectionery. Mayberry USA had 12 people in it. 12 deputized firemen. Another coffee shop, apartment building. This is all on the same four sides. <clears throat> the propane tank lights off, and there starts your fire growth. A buddy of mine, one time he, uh, in the city of Hagerstown, uh, the shift commander called him on the radio. We were working dispatch, and he said, uh, Engine 2, give me a, a status report. Well, how much fire you got back there? And he said, Chief, I got fire from the earth to the sky. And he did. It was a paint shop. So, uh, those are all of our exposures. I highlighted some of them, mainly uh, Turn the Page Bookstore and the Napa, because what did that just kind of change our fire load that we have? Kind of increased it beyond what we already had of our ordinary combustibles, and obviously the, the, the propane burning. So that was all four sides. The red building on the, on the bottom corner, that's obviously a couple of days later. And we stopped it where we wanted to stop it. There's the confectionery with the heat transfer. 
an unprotected exposure. Debris had come across, and three days later, guy got a leaky roof because we had some more rain and snow. Couldn't find out why he was get, had a leak. They went up to the roof, and he had a, about a six-inch by six-inch hole that had burnt through. Didn't even think about it. You know, you're wetting down the, the, the front sides. We missed it. Could have had another catastrophic event. Um, so it, it uh, made it kind of interesting. Kind of a little bit more of a floor plan of where, where the ladder trucks were. Where you see truck two in the yellow, um, it, at the library in that apartment house is where they stopped it. A truck, the, the truck two got in there uh, and was really able to, uh, along with some additional hand lines, really make a good aggressive attack. And he had defensive operations on one end of the town, or one end of the fire, and offensive on the other. So he, it, it, there had to be some coordinated efforts there. Um, one thing that, that we found that's similarity, and I'll point it out in the other incident, um, is can't, don't forget about the rear of the building. When they call for help, they mean they need help. You had a whole separate incident back there because the way the buildings were chopped up and, and the apartments and the way it was burning, you had a lot. He had a real big operation. He had more of an operation in the rear of the building than you did in the front. The front was mostly defensive. All the, all the hard work was being done in the back, and they had about a third of the manpower there, and they called for it. And after they called for it, they just didn't get aggressive enough. They just rehabbed themselves and just kept doing, doing the job. Sort of the uh, incident command structure. You heard, the, you heard Chief Six as the incident commander. When Chief Six got out of his car, he lost command and control. Chief from the neighboring department, uh, who was riding on an engine, ended up establishing the com- uh, taking over the command. Because there was a lot of stuff that was being missed. Um, one, because of the radio system. And the chief got sucked into being, you know, the firefighter. But then the mayor got there. Chief, what are you going to do to save my, save my town? My town's burning. You know, and this is a mayor that takes a lot of pride. A lot of pride in his town. He's been mayor, how long, Greg, 20 years? Okay. I mean, like I said, this is a little bit about Mayberry. And they take a lot of pride in their town. And, and it is extremely clean. <clears throat> was running short on some officers, so the, the deputy chief who actually had operations was also taking care of division, uh, or side A, of the building. We tried to get him away from that. We tried to get him up to the command post because the chief was out running around. And um, the chief from Sharpsburg, who was the incident commander, was like, you know, this was something new for us for another chief to come into another district and have command. Our county used to be very, very territorial. That if if I was a chief riding an engine to a house fire in our neighboring department and there was a sergeant in charge of the fire, he stayed in charge. The chief didn't always become in charge. We're we're changing that a bit. We're working with that. Um... Because we've had incidents like this that it just came out and said somebody with a little bit more experience at times needs to be there either to directly mentor them or put them into a direct operational role. This, 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 um, this call is about 18 miles from our, our town. We don't normally run with them unless it's a second or third alarm. Uh, that is something that we've wanted to do is that's on the task list from these, from these incidents, that we, don't, we, we do good uh, and fair mutual aid training with the companies that we, we run with every day, but nothing on a large-scale basis. Because when we do large-scale incident training, nobody shows up. It's a weekend, you've announced it, you've told everybody, you might get 15 people, 20 people. One thing that I didn't put into, in, into this um, and give you a little dynamic is 
We do have a division of emergency services. We have a director who has the ultimate authority within Washington County for fire and emergency services. He had pneumonia and was at home, sick, didn't have a deputy director yet, um, and he struggles. I mean, he has a, if, if he could really get the backing that he needs, he might be able to, to get us somewhere. But because of all the 27 independent companies, you know, we get some funding from the county, but we're 27 independent nonprofit organizations that the county said you can be a fire company. So, um, command was located on the east side. Uh, after the chief, the, his white car there, drove around the block and did his size up. He got out of the car. Um, the yellow van back there at one time was my chief's vehicle. And right behind it is, a, is another uh, suburban that was a chief's vehicle from the neighboring department in Frederick County, Maryland. We lined them all up that way so that we could try to have some type of communications. Low band, high band, and 800. So we really started having some radio problems because people could not talk. We did not know, and we were trying to find portables to give these companies the function. Um, we, tr- we, have a, we have a very, and I don't know the significant name of it, but in the uh, police department command vehicle and in the director's vehicle, they have this computer-aided box that they can plug radios together and make it all work? Well, it couldn't get there. When did it get there? After the, finally the, the sheriff and uh, the police chief of the town kind of got a command vehicle there. So uh, it took a lot to get that. We brought everybody, we tried to get everybody together at the command post and say, hey, you know, we got this fire, we're starting to get this fire knocked down. We got a real good handle on it. Now we need to start building out the command structure. We need to start planning. That was a concept that we never, ever in Washington County really had before. You know, NIMS teaches us set time frames as part of your incident action plan. Well, I went to the chief and, and, and their deputy chief who had operations and said, we need to start planning. We don't need, we're going to be out of here by lunchtime. We're going to leave the ladder truck hooked up to the hydrant and just pump water into it. We're going to be good. Seven days later, they finally terminated command. Millions and millions of dollars later. Some of the communications hampering I've already talked about. Uh, first arriving units, we didn't have predetermined assignments. Second engine does this, third engine does this, fourth engine does this, second alarm engine, first arriving does this. Who does RIT? It was all micromanaged by the incident commander. That's the way we always did it. I'm not saying that it was right, but we're changing, and we've done a really good job at getting away from that form of micromanagement. Uh, Engine 21 to command assignment. Well, I'm the second arriving engine, and I heard the first arriving engine say they dropped the line. Well, duh, I need to pick it up. Make sure he's getting water. Loudoun County, uh, they do something that's a part of, and and Frederick County does the same thing. As soon as any of their companies, and and, and a complement of companies is anything of two units, an engine and a tanker, an engine and ambulance, they send a battalion chief. That That is their standard rule now. One, to safety for their own people and communications. Um... We talked about doing that. Uh, we just, we've just we been working on developing an incident safety officer program where volunteer chiefs or volunteer officers or people that are trained to the incident safety officer level uh, would leave the county to go with companies outside the county to act as a liaison and, and safety. And you, you thought we were taking, taking their last dollar away from them. I don't need you following me to Frederick County. Well, I'm just going to help. But it's developing that cultural change that some communities throughout the United States has overcome. And unfortunately, we're taking very baby steps to get there. Again, Jefferson County, West Virginia didn't have anything. Now, here's a clicker. Mayday, mayday, mayday. 
That really threw a clincher into it from Loudoun County, Virginia. It was coming across the radio as if they were in a basement at one of these buildings. The person that that, that, uh, sounded the mayday was on the wrong talk group. He was on the talk group for this fire that they were assigned to go out of county. Loudoun County had heard the mayday Called, we have a, a common radio frequency uh, throughout most of the metro D.C. area all the way up into, in, into Washington County uh, that you can talk to all these major metropolitan counties to us um, to get your mutual aid. Uh, Loudoun County calls Washington County says, you have a May Day on your incident. It's Loudoun County engine, the number, and they're in the basement. Well, if they were in the basement that we thought they were in, they, they got that May Day out pretty quick because it was, it was an inferno. You could have roasted marshmallows in, in about 30, three seconds. So, and it wasn't even our incident. So that totally takes a, a, a scrambling to get that confirmed. And luckily by that point, we really had a good handle on where companies were functioning. We had five different accountability systems. We use a tag system, like the Clemens tag system, uh, or Salamander tags. Uh, some uh, Jefferson County and Loudoun County used a uh, like a passport type system. Um, Frederick County was in transition, so they just brought us everything. Uh, some departments showed up with a metal ring that they used to use with an ID number. That was their accountability tag. Who's 12001? I don't have the slightest idea. But, okay, they're attached to engine 12, so it must be from there. Um, big problem with freelancing. It, it, it just, it was, it was never endless after we did the incident action. Um, established a safety officer pretty quick. But how many do you think we needed of a fire of this magnitude? Probably more than one. How many RIT teams do you think we should have had? That group, the group that you saw gathered around at the front of the confectionery, that was the RIT team. They, would have had, they were right in the middle of the block. There wasn't a direct pathway if they needed to get to the back of the building. We needed to have two. So when you have a fire in, in these types of of situations, put that on your incident checklist. That is something that we did develop, uh, a lot of us independently, as we came up with command sheets beyond just the, the canned ones. We added things that we knew that had happened to this, these t- this type of event. Um, more than one rapid intervention team. Rehab became a problem because guys were sp- spread out. We had to call a second canteen unit out of Frederick County. We ran out of food, ran out of water, had to go get some. Some of the risk exposures, I think you guys have seen those. Can't stress enough that the incident safety officer has to be established early um, to make things work. Share, if you have a company that you are mutual aid with in your jurisdiction that uh, it's, it's across the bridge type concept, share your policies with them. I was amazed that people didn't normally do that. Uh, so that when they did come to your county to help you, they knew what was going on. Develop interoperable, we want to have interoperable radios, develop interoperable uh, operations groups to be able to discuss how do you guys do accountability? The department that we run with in West Virginia, because where Williamsport is, they have this uh, grace system. They rip this thing off, and it's a pass device that activates in a computer. Well, we, I mean, we don't have anything like that. So to try to help manage that, it becomes difficult. Establish collapse zones. When's the last time we did that? You don't think about it sometimes in your room and contents fires. But with our lightweight construction, 
we probably should be thinking about it more often. Staging. We had all these units coming. Well, somebody took it upon themselves to establish staging areas. Well, what they did is, is they established one on the other end of the town that half the units that were coming from this side couldn't get to. So what'd they do? Hey, they just drove on in and got out. Became a nightmare in managing it. That doesn't happen anymore. They've, they've had incidents, um, and all the companies that this department particularly runs with now has pre-designated staging areas for the companies to go to. Uh, and it's worked out well for them. One other thing that, uh, to mention through this is when they lost power, that power went to the pumping station for the, the water system. When the water started dribbling out, they needed to send somebody to the town reservoir to open up the valve as their backup water supply. Just under a million gallons of water was flowed. Total infrastructure was lost. Telephone, cable, power, even if you had something, you lost your internet unless you had a phone, but they have real bad cell coverage there. So as dependent as you get to this stuff, you lost it. A nursing home running on emergency power. How long, does anybody have a nursing home in their first year area or hospital? Bunch of them? How long, how long can, they, can they operate on an emergency generator? Yep, 24 hours. And depending on how old the nursing home is, uh, we have two nursing homes in, in, in Williamsport, three nursing homes in, in, in our immediate area. Two of them are 24 hours sustainability. The other one might be six because it's a very, very old nursing home. And it runs off of diesel. A lot of them now run off of propane. So, uh, but they lost the water system. So now you had boiling warnings. Now can you see why we went to a seven day? And the, uh, the chief called me after that when we started discussing the, the after action plan. He says, man, do I owe you an apology. I thought you were just crazy thinking that we needed to have a planning section and started planning for the next six hours. Food for the guys. You know, how are we going to get their fire station back in operation? We called the county, had the county come down with an emergency generator on a, on a that they had stored, but now we had to get an electrician. Well, you know what? The county has electrical code. Just can't back that generator right up to the back of the fire station and have an electrician go in without a permit and create a, a pigtail to, to get the fire station back in play. Politics. Never think that a politics would get into play trying to put a fire station back in, into operation. Two years later, small town of Clear Spring, Maryland, which is right off of Interstate 70. So if any of you have come, from, uh, come east to the fire academy and haven't gonna come across the turnpike, uh, you've come right through this town. Um, um, right around 3,800 gallons a minute. It was, was estimated. Yeah. It just it, it was a domino effect because the, the ladder truck in the rear of the building, that was the first one to lose water. Or notice the water pressure change. And at that hydrant, they didn't have a, a hydrant assist valve on it to be able to pump it. So that's when they knew they needed to go get the emergency generator. The emergency generator didn't activate either for the water plant. So that... Like I said, Murphy's, Murphy's Law was, was, was in their hands that day. What's that? No, not, not immediately. But tankers were called. You know, they would have to go outside of town to get water. So, um, and, 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 and the small streams that they have in, in the town wouldn't have been any type of sustainability for it. Small volunteer department, they run about 500 calls a year. Again, very old construction. Flip side of the, of the weather. End of July, 95 degrees. 
one of the best weight loss programs I had for that day. Okay, um, 80% humidity. As soon as you walked outside, it it took your breath away, and it was hot. Uh, I think I drank four bottles of water, um, and didn't even realize it, and still didn't pee. So, 5:30 in the evening. Same type of th- scenario that we had with the first one. Our transition time. Our nine to five workers are on their way home. Our shift workers that work shift work, work evening shift, have left. First engine went out the door with two. Second engine went out the door with one. Uh, engine 51 went out the door with five. Um, they, they were probably one of the more heavier companies. First ladder truck was, uh, truck two was driven by myself and a lieutenant. Um, and then truck 26, which is a, a, a ladder tower, did come with four. But then we had, because we didn't have the staffing immediately, we had units that were failing to respond, so we started replacing them. And, you know, again, that's that domino effect. You, you can only rob Peter to pay Paul so many times in, in, with our volunteer system. Chief did go to a, a, a second alarm pretty quick. As he was coming into town, he lives about five, again, lives about five miles outside of town, and uh, the first arriving engine did give him a, a good size up. And... Uh, he, didn't, he went second alarm for precaution, but it was probably one of the better decisions that he made. When you say, Greg, because it he, he got that help coming a little quick. <clears throat> Greg Yost was uh, the uh, side C uh, division leader on this incident. So these second alarm companies, all of them are coming at least, at least 12 to 15 miles away, if not greater. So they got an 18 to 20 minute ride. You see the air unit and rehab unit. We have a countywide air unit. It looks like a big rescue squad. All they do can, is, is fill bottles. And we have a rehab unit that is, uh, uh, we call it the burger buggy. Uh, they have food, candy bars, granola bars, uh, drinks, and things like that that, uh, that come out with auxiliary people. Really never went to a third alarm, went equivalent. Where they had some special calls on top of it. But it only had 110 people. Not that many more people than what we had on the day, daytime when it goes to the fourth alarm. But the comparison is, didn't have to go four alarms to get the 110. Because you had your, your, your normal nine to five workers back in your community. Fifteen engines ended up showing up. Four ladder trucks, six tankers. They have tankers on their assignment because they know their water system stinks. And we just about pumped the reservoir dry. The chief, the chief was leaving the scene and driving to the reservoir and looking at the measurement on it. Tankers that were in staging were now going to the reservoir to keep the reservoir full so that the town would have water. So pretty interesting concepts. Ordinary construction, masonry, old stone type buildings. The flaw was two stories in the front, three in the back. The back of this, the back of this structure, they had a stream that they had to cross. So fire trucks couldn't get across the little bridges to the back of the houses like a car could to get into the back. So there's a lot of hand work. Ladder truck had to go through trees uh, to be able to get into position to do to do anything. So it became very very uh, uh, challenging. It was under construction also. Uh, gentleman that owned owned the part the building was re- renovating it. Wanted to make a little hotel bed and breakfast. What do we have? Boone Hotel bed and breakfast in Boonesboro. Nor Roberts didn't own this one, though. A good old boy from, from the town did. Picture there on the, on the left is what they had when they first got there. Doesn't look bad, does it? A little bit of smoke. Color of the smoke might tell us what immediately. Yep. Might be, into the, might be the structure burning. You know? Dave Dotson's The Art of, of Reading Smoke type concept. 
it's not real black, there isn't petroleum products burning type thing. As soon as the two guys started to make entry, and they got in, and it just got just enough air, somebody maybe prematurely broke some windows and gave it a little bit of air, it went to the top right very quickly. You see the yellow ladder truck there. It was on scene within about nine minutes of dispatch. So that, they, that's just about what we saw. I, again, I was driving the ladder truck, and in 33 years of operating a fire apparatus or being involved in the fire service, I've seen operators do it, but I've never had to do it. As soon as I got out of the truck, my breath was taken away. I immediately put the rest of my turnout gear on, and for me to set the ladder truck up, I had to put an air pack on. And I went through two bottles. Uh, I have my bunker pants on. So, um, but a lot of times I don't. So, um, and then the bottom picture obviously uh, is about the same time period. Went looking for the chief. The smoke was so dense, I couldn't see the power line. I couldn't see the wires. And I wasn't sure where to put the ladder truck up at because I didn't want to put them up straight into wires. In any of your communities, where's your power wires? Where's your, where's your wires at? In the front or back of the buildings? Back? Yeah, in, in the town of Williamsport, they're in the back too, but on, on, on the odd streets, they're out front. So in our town center, they're in the back. But this is their town center. I went down to try to find the chief. He, I thought he was dead. He was laying down on the sidewalk trying to see what was happening. His chief's car, if you can see in this bottom picture, that's actually him, and he's got the back of his car, uh, back of his, his uh, trunk. trunk up, the back of his vehicle, putting his gear on. And as he got back in the car to sit there, the smoke was coming in the car. So he said, what do I do? So he got out. He thought the car was on fire too. <laughs> but then he realized it wasn't. And he got out, and he's laying on the thing, and he's trying to breathe because he couldn't see. It, and it, the humidity just pulled that smoke right down. As you can see, it traveled pretty quick. Something on both these incidents that I, uh, you'll see in some of the recommendations is, if you have a town center like this, or, or have buildings and have alleys behind them where people have off-street parking, work with your town councils or your, or, or your governments to get those buildings labeled. We had a real big problem on both these incidents, knowing that if we were talking 111 Cumberland Street, nobody knew what 111 Cumberland Street was in the rear. It was about 30 minutes into the incident, 40 minutes into the incident, that uh, the special operations chief got there, heard people saying, "Which building? How many? How many doors down from the fire building? Is it? Are you talking in the rear?" And they finally went and got spray paint and did like the USAR labeling and labeled the back of the buildings and the front of the buildings bigger, so you knew what the chiefs were, or, or, or the command officers were talking about. If you don't have um, the rear of your building's labeled with an address. I highly recommend that. If you're a volunteer department, it's a real good fundraiser to get the citizens to buy the signs. If you go out there and uh, there's there's actual fundraising uh, group out there that'll help you do address labeling. Uh, they'll, they'll send you this kit with metal house numbers on it, and you just put the numbers on it for the respective address. And uh, I know our department does. I think we sell them for like 10, 15 bucks. Uh, for people that want to have big address signs as a fundraiser, but get your get the rear of your buildings labeled, especially if you have a, if you have a town center. Because in, in our town, we have houses behind houses, and and they they may have an address of Leaf Alley versus Conica Jig Street, and you know that's something that we've really identified as we start training new members about that. <clears throat> Life safety issue. 
uh, because of the economics downcline at that time, we were seeing a very large transit community coming through our areas. They're getting off the interstates, getting off the rail systems, uh, and just getting to our area. Um, and they're occupying a lot of vacant buildings. This building was vacant. They knew, there was, they were, they knew that there was a, a vagrant that was living in it. Um, he was getting fed by one of the local restaurants. And they couldn't find him. And the building got so involved, they couldn't get in and do the search. It, it wasn't until almost 11, 12 o'clock that night that we were able to confirm a secondary search was complete. Keeping the common sense approach. We had a lot of debris flying. When you have opposing streams trying to penetrate metal roofs, uh, we, we definitely had, if, uh, if you had some type of fundraiser, we sell tips in Washington County. Like pool tabs for fundraisers, it's like gambling. If we would have carried one of them on the fire truck with us, we probably would have been able to help pay for the expense of the call because we'd have been able to raise enough money there or pass the boot around. That's how many citizens were coming out to take pictures and, 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 uh, and stuff. Uh, the chief did give um, a, a pretty good report uh, as an incident action of where he wanted it stopped. I have a little bit of an audio, but it's terrible. We were in the middle that day of changing from low band, 2008, 2010, changing to our 400 megahertz radio system. They had the low band patched into the 450. Some companies were still losing, using low band. Some companies were using the high band. You want to talk about a nightmare. It, 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 it really did. It, turned, it was ugly. A lot of communications was missed, again, because of that. Since then, all the patches are down. It's a, it's a great radio system. Um, I live 28 minutes, 28 miles from, from Hancock, where, where Chief Yost is from. I can sit in my recliner. He can sit in his recliner, and we can talk all day now. Three years ago, we couldn't do that. Property conservation, small town. Revenue lost. Economic impact to the communities, both these communities. Millions of dollars lost in, 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 in both these incidents. Had a rapid horizontal fire spread. Again, the humidity. Uh, command and control and developing the IMS system also came into play. We did a lot better with command on this incident than we did the first one. The chief wasn't pulling hose line, but because he is a, a, a part of the town leadership, he got worried about that reservoir. And they just didn't have anybody they could call on the phone. They have one town employee to go check the reservoir. Water supply again became an issue. Uh, I know the ladder pipes in the rear of the building, uh, they, they were losing water. And they were towards the end of the water system. So that, that's where, where it was getting affected. Um, again, life safety. We were unable to confirm, uh, confirm that. We did have to evacuate one dwelling um, that was occupied. Another, another house that did burn, unfortunately, was like a hoarder's paradise. The lady, the lady had died, the occupant had died, and the next day they were supposed to have an auction of all her property. Guess what didn't happen? The auction. Uh, they ended up losing a lot of the second floor of that, that house. Um, staging of extra alarm units. Worked out really well because we didn't have we had units coming from both sides, but they had the interstate to use. We staged them outside of town, and when we needed them, we brought them in. We didn't have as big of units just showing up and parking and coming down and saying we're here. We did have, however, have a, uh, a chief that got pretty irate. He had called multiple times, and he needed help. He needed help in the rear. Again. Put on your tactical worksheets. Take care of the guys in the rear. I can't stress that enough. I've had multiple, I've been involved with multiple incidents where that becomes the, unfor, the forgotten area. If it's not right in front of you and you're too busy to call on the radio too many times because you're working. Because if you're not hearing anything on the radio in our area, that means they're working. Ain't got time to chit-chat. 
Again, identification of your rear accesses. Some of the addresses that were involved with our rapid fire growth. And we could watch it. We were watching it come down the street. Because there was holes in the floors that kind of just made it a chimney and helped it move. The command post was on the east side of the incident. Uh, he tried to manage the multiple radio channels. How many of us in, are, are volunteer here? Okay, majority. Do you guys get command aids or think about appointing a command aid to, to help you out? Or is that a standard practice for you? That's not a normal practice for us, is to have command aids. It's starting to get there. Uh, a lot of us are just taking the initiative that if I hear he's got a working fire and I might not be, our company might not be on it, I'll just get in my chief's car and I'll go and kind of go up to him and say, hey, I'm here to help. Where do you need me? And it's kind of worked out that you're not stepping on territorial toes. Okay? But I'm a big believer of having a command aid or an incident management technician, whatever fancy term, or field technician that you come up with, even in the volunteer system. You know, battalion chiefs and large municipalities, they got somebody that drives them around, you know, does all the writing, does all their scheduling, answers the phone when they don't want to talk to the wives type thing. Uh, we don't have that in the volunteer system. I like using the ambulance crew. First arriving ambulance crew, if they're not engaged in, in direct operations, they're good statisticians. They know how to do all that fan fancy documentation. Uh, unfortunately, the command ended up being located in the ideal H exterior atmosphere um, and became interesting. Communications was, was hampered because we, we were doing this patch system. Uh, the patching works great now, but it didn't that day. Uh, a lot of the mutual aid companies coming from outside uh, different states who were used to operating on some of our radio frequencies didn't have that anymore uh, because they didn't have the right patches set up. Um, but fortunately, they have fixed that. Have multiple operations channels in place. And, and, it, and again, when uh, our director of emergency services, uh, when he got there, he was able to help assist with some of that, which I think was a, a major difference between the two incidents because he, he was able, they, there was an extra person there. Um, some other similarities, never had written set up in the back of the building or safety. I only had one safety officer. This one probably needed at least three. And needed at least two RIT teams. Rehab became an issue. We Again, we had multiple companies working in the rear of this middle of the block or end of the block type unit. And... We didn't get them rehabbed, and we weren't able to get them rotated out. Uh, that crew resource management thing, I know I need to become better at it, uh, of making sure that our number one resource is taken care of. <clears throat> Did have some high-tension power lines uh, that got scorched, but they weren't damaged. Uh, we did establish a pretty good collapse area this time. Uh, and we had a heavy fire load because of, of the type of construction that it was. The propane, we didn't ever have any of it lit off, light off, but a lot of the houses are heated by propane up there. We don't have natural gas. So in the back of the building, they were back there shutting them all off. A lot of the, operate, pump, the pump operator, the first arriving engine, the pump operator, the second arriving engine, and myself were all in air packs. So when you're trying to radio something in an air pack, it doesn't go very well on top of the firefighters trying to, to yell at you and tell you what's going on inside. It just raises the uh, concern. Again, establish it early. One thing that we haven't learned from yes yet is we ended up with multiple accountability systems. We were very, very late, very late into the incident going around and collecting tags. I have a habit of grabbing the, the ring of tags from our unit if I'm riding the right front seat, going up to the incident commander and say, 
uh, Engine Tanker 2's here and handed him our tags. Well, if he doesn't have somebody to manage that, they just lay there until he does. So it was almost an hour or better before we had anybody starting to do any type of direct accountability uh, with tracking the units. We know it's a problem. We are seeking out easier ways to fix it. Uh, and again, this incident safety officer program that we're, we've got established in our county, um, and, the, and the, the ladies and gentlemen that have, are, are approved in the, into the program, that is going to be one of their responsibilities when they respond in, respond in an independent vehicle is to do that accountability uh, because we really need to do a better job at it. Our communication center gives us part checks uh, every 15 minutes, and uh, the numbers weren't matching. Once we got things put together, we had a, a lot more people than they had in the, in, into the CAD system, which became interesting when you went from 85 people in CAD to 110 because that's what you had tags for. Outside The outside departments coming into our county, we, when we go responding on, on the air, we say our, our unit number and how many people we have on board. That gets entered into CAD. That's our initial type of accountability. Magic number is for a box alarm, we want to be into the 20s somewhere of people for, for a structure fire. Well, at the park checks, they were, they were getting shifted around. Um, staging, one thing the chief did do is establish it early. What do you need to do to prepare for the big one? Some stuff that we've been doing in, in, in my community over the last couple of years is we brought a tower uh, truck, a tower ladder into our area that's right next door to our mutual aid company, and we set it up at different locations, <coughs> and we started taking pictures of the rooftops. We've gone and knocked on some of the doors and said, hey, can we climb up into your attic areas and see what it's like? And we've started taking pictures. Now, the hard part, how do you manage that? Some departments that have the money to put uh, all this information onto a tablet or onto a laptop, it's easy. Um, we're trying to get there. But we're taking pictures that if we have to get it, we can get it, bring it up, and see what the interior of these homes in our downtown uh, town center is like. We have a town clock, and that's pretty much the fire stop for about 18 homes a, or 18 buildings from one end to the other to where the town clock is. That's where the fire stop is. I knew, I knew it somewhat, but I didn't know it was that open. Uh, the, the fire could travel that easy from one end to the other. Know your community power grid. That if you lose power in this end of your community, know how that works, along with the water system. Know how it works. Teach your company officers how it works. How's your, how is your community get water? If you don't have any fire hydrants, well, somebody's got to bring it to you. But have predetermined fill sites if that's the case. But know your water system. Know where your valves are for your water system, that if you have to open it up a little bit from the water plant, you know how to get more water and more volume and pressure. Get creative in your pre-planning. Uh, Google is a great resource. Google Earth, if they've come around and taken the pictures of, of, of your area, use those. When you're building your maps um, for your district and sharing them, put a Google picture of, uh, along with it on the back side of it, especially for your mutual aid companies. You're, you could have companies in, in our area that we give maps to that if, if they've come into Williamsport for a fire, it must be big. And they're transferring into our area. So they don't have any type of district familiarization. But we've started this trial run with building, putting Google pictures, uh, Google Earth pictures on the back side of it. So that they have a, a visual uh, besides the map. Share the information with your automatic aid, mutual aid companies. Start training for the big one. Don't be scared and work with your town 
fathers that, hey, we, we want to lay lines. We want to bring a couple ladder trucks into there. Uh, you know, some departments don't have ladder trucks. So they got to use 35, 45, bang, you know, 45 foot banger ladders. Throw them. Make sure that you know if you have to throw that big ladder, what does it really reach? And if you are getting a ladder truck, uh, I, I, love, I love reading in some of the, the, the magazines, you know, the first ladder truck was 43 minutes to get to the scene because that was the closest one, and it usually came from a municipality. You know, we're very fortunate that we have some of those resources in our, our area. We have six ladder trucks in our county, but one fire can pretty much take four of them. Again, addressing on the front and the rear. Take pictures of your buildings. Uh, we have a big nursing home that just started a major renovation, and it was a flat roof since the day it was built. Now they put all these uh, trusses up, and now they're putting a pitched roof over top of it. Not taking the flat roof down and redoing it. It's just that is going to be one heck of a hazard for us. And we've been taking pictures left and right of that, and we're automatic aid. Um, and we've been sharing them with the first new company with it. Again, do your property walkthroughs. Walk your alleys if you have them. You know, uh, make sure that your people understand it. Train in the incident management system. I can't stress that enough. That uh, do drills with matchboxes. Have your kids make Lego houses and do drills. Something that I started in our line officers meetings uh, is the first half hour of every meeting is some type of officer development or incident uh, development type training. I mean, we train a lot in our company. We train every Monday night. But we don't always train on the things that we need to do every day. You know, uh, knowing how to utilize the incident management system. We have a really big FUPA that goes on in our county that instead of saying you're Division, uh, division One, we just make you operations. Well, operations doesn't need to be there just yet, but uh, it's, it's something that we have to fix because you're taught operations one side of it and then we use it for another. Uh, but train on it. Um, YouTube is a great resource. If you're sitting around the firehouse and you want to do something, use YouTube and have the guys give you, give you a size up. Have them start calling out their assignment. You know, engine uh, 12-1 on the scene, laying from uh, A and 1st Street. Next in engine, pick up our line. We have a three-story brick dwelling with smoke showing. Pulling an attack line and going in. Lieutenant 2 will have the Conica Jig Street Command. You know, have them practice that. We've got a really neat radio system now. We can go to a, a channel that's private and nobody can hear us. We can say Maydays all day long, and nobody's going to say, hey, did you hear that Mayday? We used to do it on our load band system. Somebody was calling and saying, did you hear that Mayday? Where's the fire at? Well, nowhere. They were just training. Practice your standard operating, uh, standard operating practices. Establish them with your mutual aid companies. What's expected when they arrive? Are they supposed to call on the radio to get an assignment? Or if they know they're the second or third new engine company, they're supposed to do this. You know, they're your two in, two out. They're, they're your rapid intervention. They go to the rear of the building. As if you're that guy that's going to be the incident commander, recognize early that you're losing control. And don't be scared that you're losing control. Take that step back. Lock yourself in the engine. Lock yourself in a car. Hide. So that you can get refocused. Dr. Richard Gassaway, if you've taken any of his programs or listened to anything that he has to say about decision-making, you just can't make it if you've lost it. You have to stay focused with that. Situational awareness. Attempt to manage the radio traffic. In my chief's car, uh, they, they thought I was pretty crazy. Uh, we had some money left over from a project. I put a wireless headset system in it because I'm still one of them guys that doesn't like, to, I'll sit in the car, but I don't like to be in the car, but I don't like missing something. 
So I put a wireless headset system in it. As you're, as you're developing your specifications for new apparatus, if you don't have a cheese vehicle, put headset systems in it. Buy a headset system for your portable radio. Yeah, you got that mic and everything, but the nice thing is, is you're blocking out all that other traffic. And when you need to hear that critical radio traffic, it's, you'll have it. Develop policies that you have command staff. Support. Manage and out your, your allocation of resources. And if you have interoperable radio problems, fix it. Figure out how you need to do it. Work with your, 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 your county governments or city governments to fix it. Have a good PIO. On the Boonesboro incident, the first one we reviewed, it got out really quick that this was a Nora Roberts property. So we had all the D.C. and Baltimore TV stations there. I'm okay with local news type thing, but when you've got six cameras in front of you, and they, and, the, and, the, and they said, just go up to, just, just do it, just take care of it. Because we had all these news crews that were just freelancing around. So we wanted to get them to the firehouse and get it fixed. Well, next thing I know, I'm getting a, a text message from a buddy of mine who's in Atlanta, who CNN had picked, uh, Fox News had picked this up and made this national news because it was Noah Roberts. And he's saying, I'm watching you, I'm in Atlanta, and I'm watching you on a fire? What's so special about this? Well, as soon as they said Nora Roberts, it was there. And she was a great, great to the fire department and to the community uh, after this, during the event and, and still is. Finances. When you have to start paying for some of this stuff, who pays for fuel? If you're on a fire for six, seven hours, who pays for the fuel to be delivered? Have that figured out ahead of time. I went to the chief uh, on, the, on the first incident and said, hey, yeah, you're going to be here a while. You might want to start thinking about fuel. Well, who's going to pay for it? Well, I don't know. You better call the mayor. But you've got an engine that's in a quarter of a tank, and it's still pumping. Have that figured out. Have that a part of your pre-plans, of your incident management plans, or emergency operation plans in your town. Again, uh, know, know, know your water system so if you lose the water pumps. Um, between the two incidents, almost 2 million gallons of water was flown. It's a lot of water. The, the town of Boonesboro uh, was out without power for over 20 hours. Um, that's a lot. Again, with incident management, know it, live it, love it. Make it as special as you as your wife and kids because it will really help you understand it. Practice unified command. As soon as the cops get there, you know, they want to take charge. They disrespect the police officers in the house. Place key stakeholders in positions. Get that mayor instead of him running around town. Make that mayor your public information officer. Get, get him into the command post so that when decisions need to be made, he's there in your small town. I mean, there's some departments, the town has a little bit more money than the fire department. Fire department may only operate off a $50,000 or $100,000 a year budget, where the town operates off a half a million dollar a year budget. So they may have a little bit of finances that they could help with. Train, train, train. The significant thing out of all, both these incidents, there was no firefighter injuries or civilian injuries on either or. Uh, we're still working on developing our operational SOGs from a county-wide standpoint. We're getting closer. Um, have a better understanding of your emergency management. As soon as you get a big incident like that, they want to activate the EOC. Because if you have the Red Cross involved and you need people that are going to be taken care of and it's multiple, uh, multiple victims, they like getting that stuff activated. And as soon as they do... That throws another level into your incident management system. That if you've never done that before uh, and played with EOC type concepts, it, it, it could become confusing. On both incidents, there was over 35 agencies involved. 
ATFs, power companies, insurance companies. Uh, you know, not every owner of a property had the same insurance company. So you now you're dealing with multiple insurance companies. And now when you get ATF involved, you've got different levels of the investigation besides your state police, county, local police, and fire marshal's office. Safety is everybody's responsibility. If you need to make a recommendation, make sure that you make the recommendation to the incident commander that, hey, don't, for, maybe, don't forget about this in the back. If you've got to physically walk around the back of the building, grab a hold of the incident commander and say, I better get some help back here or I'm going home, you might want to listen to them. Have facts and good documentation throughout your incident because then it turns into a very big volume of data, especially when you're dealing with all, these, all the different government agencies. They love data. Have a facilities generator. Fire Station 6 now has one. Um, our communication system is in place, and it is semi-interoperable. Uh, throughout. We can now talk to the police effectively. We never could do that before. We could talk to county roads now. We never could do that before. Uh, again, with your pre-plan, take pictures. Everybody, and if you don't have one, I'm sure your kids do, walk around your town and take the pictures. Know when you do have power wires in your town, What's power, what's cable, what's television? Know, know what levels they are. Usually power is the highest, but it drops down and comes across for feeders. Have a relationship with your power company that when they're called, they know they need to get there. And it's, it's usually not a big problem uh, nationwide, but at 3 o'clock in the morning it could be when you need to get your utility secured. If you have a, a, somebody that owns a lot of the properties in your town, uh, like the, the Clear Spring incident, this, this gentleman, Mr. Begunier, he owned half that block. So you could have a good, real good relationship with him as he's rebuilding this property. Yeah, he's got to bring it up to code, but once you build that relationship, you can now go in and take pictures and have it pre-planned for the next time of how many apartments he's going to be putting in there. Rehab your people. Force them to get the rehab. Don't let them hide. If you need more help, call for it early. Uh, countywide SOGs. Have a better working relationship with your county government, your county in building inspectors, engineers. Uh, you know, when you have a collapse, I don't, I'm not an engineer. I can't tell you the strengths and other weaknesses of, of how it collapsed. I can just tell you, hey, it collapsed, it's weak. You know, have a relationship with them so that when they come out, they know what they're getting into. That's the final outcome of the Boonesboro incident. That's a bed and breakfast. Uh, if you're rich, you can stay there. Uh, they had a real nice grand opening, invited the fire service uh, to come in and walk through it. Uh, that is all hardwood stained porch decking. Uh, very impressive property. Uh, as you can see to the left of that, the subway and those other buildings, just within the last year, they finally got rebuilt. And, you know, lawsuits, insurance companies, type thing of who the property owners were. That's about six, min six months after the fire in Clear Spring uh, that that occurred in, in January of 2011. They are just now starting to finish up some of the work. It got into a historical society. A guy was going to tear part of the properties down and build new ones. Oh my goodness, you can't do that. Because what was left standing was historical. So he had to, he's working on redoing the properties to meet the uh, historical society ordinance. There's my contact information. Uh, be glad to send this to you if you want to use any of it for a company drill with your officers. Uh, 
It's another resource for you, and appreciate your time.